our sermon tonight is called A Poor Steward of Manifold Grace. And I'm afraid that that begins to describe Gideon, our would-be hero from chapters 6 and 7, A Poor Steward of Manifold Grace. Judges chapter 8 considers or uh, continues our consideration of the life and exploits of Gideon, uh, the judge that God has raised up to deliver his uh, people from the Midianite menace. And as the Lord has patiently and compassionately now built up the faith of this would-be hero, Gideon has become the mighty man of valor that the Lord said he was back in chapter 6. By the hand of God, by the mercy and grace of God, Gideon tore down the altar to Baal that his father had put up in Ophrah. He had gathered an army together from the northern tribes of Israel. They rallied behind him at Mount Gilead, prepared to attack the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the east. And have once again, as they have for each of the last seven years, settled in the Jezreel Valley like locusts, innumerable. And it was there that the Lord put Gideon's fledgling faith to the test as he cut down the Israelite army to a mere 300 men and then determined to send those men into battle, not with swords and shields, but with trumpets, pitchers, and torches against a Midianite horde numbering 135,000 men. Now we've seen in detail how the Lord, every step along the way, was at work in Gideon to bolster Gideon's faith, how he was gracious to Gideon in that way. And by the time the Lord is done with Gideon, the once timid, fearful, and faithless Gideon is now faith-filled. He's a confident and skillful soldier, a confident and skillful, faith-filled servant of God. And with his lapping 300, this mighty man of valor has set the armies of Midian to flight. Chapter 7 ends with Gideon sending messengers throughout the mountains of Ephraim to ask for help with the mop-up operations. They want Ephraim to help uh, to block or to head off the escape route of the armies of Midian. And so they send into the mountains of Ephraim to ask for help. Chapter 8, then, takes a tragic turn. After this tremendous victory and the obvious deliverance given by the hand of God himself, we see both a growing contention in the heart of Israel and there is growing compromise in the heart of Gideon. Grace and mercy have been poured out by God in delivering his people. Now, Peter says, the grace of God having been given, Peter says we're to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Uh, we can't receive the grace of God in vain. We have to be good stewards of the grace that God pours out on us, and we're grateful for it. But we find here both the nation and Gideon to be poor stewards of that grace, poor stewards of manifold grace. In other words, they may have started well, but they didn't finish well. And that's the problem, right? We are to finish. We must finish well in sin in pride, what we'll see as selfish ambition, Gideon and the nation fail to acknowledge the goodness, the forbearance, the long-suffering of God, not knowing that the goodness of God should lead them to repentance. And as we work through the text, there's a warning here in this passage for us to remember, a very important warning for us to remember. As professing Christians, this is a warning that we're called throughout the Bible to remember, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Andrew Bonarm said, Let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. And I think that is profound insight. Let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. We can... After the battle is waged, the war is won, God has given us the victory, and God pours out His grace on us, we can find ourselves languishing in comfort and ease, letting our guard down. We can become prideful. We can become imagining to ourselves that uh, our strength and our might has won this victory for us. We must be as watchful after the victory, maybe even more so, as before the battle. There are dangers, you could say, on the far side of faithfulness. And we'll see why that's so important as we, look, as we work through the text together. After a great victory in chapter 7, our account then begins in chapter 8 with contention in the heart of Israel. Look at verse 1 with me. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, 
Why have you done this to us? By not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites. And they reprimanded him sharply. The ESV says they accused him fiercely. They contended against him forcefully. The Ephraimites were mad. (laughs) They were angry, right? It means the Ephraimites weren't happy. And they read Gideon here, the riot act. They didn't get invited to the original battle. They didn't get to participate in the original rout. And it was only when Midian was escaping through their territory that then Gideon uh, called them in to mop up. And they took this action on the part of Gideon, this neglect, they would say, they took it personally, as if they had been insulted. And you might think that, well, they were the tribe that Joshua had come from, so they were the great military leaders of the nation of Israel. Joshua, their great military leader, had come from Ephraim. Maybe they believed that any military action that was to be taken should be led or should at least involve them. And they were missing out on the honor. They perceived they were missing out on the honor that Gideon and the other tribes were getting. Whatever the case, this serves to show how factious and how contentious Ephraim was. And this would be an ongoing problem with them. Jephthah essentially does the same thing in Judges chapter 12. He leaves them out of a battle with Ammon. And the Ephraimites threatened to burn down his house with him inside it. They were very contentious, very angry. God here delivers his people. Let's keep this in context. And you've got the kids squabbling about it in the front yard. Ephraim is upset about it. And it just illuminates what ingratitude they had. How ungrateful Ephraim was. How selfish, how prideful And that ingratitude combined with pride, maybe envy and selfishness, selfish ambition, leads to contention. Here, contention in the heart of Israel. Like the Israelites grumbling against God when he brought them out of Egypt, here Ephraim is grumbling against God, ultimately grumbling against Gideon. Well, Gideon here, in this context, gets to practice his diplomacy now. (laughs) He's got some new diplomatic skills So in verse 2, he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? He's going to build them up, isn't he? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. You know, what could they say as a result of that? Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. We see that exemplified here in Gideon's answer to Ephraim. And it's interesting, isn't it? Formerly timid, formerly fearful and faithless Gideon, and now Gideon is the confident politician, the confident diplomat, and he quells the the anger of Ephraim. Here, apparently, he quells the anger of Ephraim with flattery. Look at what you've done, and how is what I've done even in comparison with what you've done? Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22, an angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. We see that in Ephraim, don't we? Ephraim is stirring up strife, stirring up or abounding in transgression. But on the other hand, look at how far Gideon has come, right? The work of God's grace in the life of Gideon has had a, a tremendous transformative effect. Gideon has obviously matured. He credits the Lord in verse 3, with delivering the princes, right? It was God that did that. He sets aside any pride, any personal ambition, and he credits the Ephraimites with their contribution. He diminishes his own contribution and uh, exalts or magnifies theirs. And Gideon appears to humble himself for the sake of making peace, and that's a good lesson, something commendable that Gideon does here. The Ephraimites, however, as we can see, were ungrateful. They were envious, the sin of envy, and we'll see that sin again in in Judges chapter 12. Desiring the glory of victory for themselves, they ultimately were envious that Gideon appeared appeared to have it, right? And this is exactly, exactly in keeping with the warning of Judges chapter 7 verse 2. This is what God was concerned about when he decided to humble the Israelites. He says, the people with you are too many, Gideon. They're too many. 
lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, lest they boast against me, I'm going to cut down the armies of Israel, and he cut them down to 300 men. It was this very concern, right? And you can see how the Ephraimites uh, would have fallen prey, did fall prey to this very sin, the sin of boasting in themselves. And because they missed out on the boasting they could have had, they were angry that Gideon went into battle without them. The sin of boasting in themselves for the glory in battle is simply replaced by the sin of ungrateful envy that they couldn't have had the glory for themselves. Richard Rogers, a Puritan, says, an envious person would willingly pull out one of his own eyes on the condition that the one against whom he grudgeth loses both of his. You see what a wicked, self-destructive sin Envy actually is. Gideon may have been the immediate object of their wrath, but that sin is ultimately against God. You know, envy, if you consider that sin, envy drove the wicked Cain to murder his brother Abel, right? Envy drove the sons of Jacob to plot the murder of their brother Joseph. Envy drove the Pharisees to murder the Lord of glory. Here, envy, envy drives the Ephraimites in their contentious spirit against Gideon. We should be grateful, shouldn't we, for all the ways in which the Lord has blessed us, but in particular, our brothers. When the Lord blesses someone, that should fill our heart with joy, should fill our heart with gratitude to God. Look at the grace and mercy of God and how the Lord blesses our brother, blesses our sister. Give no place to envy. Give no place to envy. Envy produces strife, produces contention. Envy is fueled by pride. Envy is fueled by ingratitude, fueled by selfishness, fueled by selfish ambition, all of which is just evil. Well, the contentious spirit among the people of Israel is only exacerbated in Gideon's next encounter. Look at verse 4. Then when Gideon came to the Jordan... He and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted but still in pursuit. I like that, right? Exhausted but still in pursuit. Put that on a t-shirt, right? That's what, we want. That's what we want to be said of us, right? I was involved in the Lord's worthy cause. I am exhausted, but I'm still in pursuit, right? We've labored to the point of exhaustion, but we're still in hot pursuit of the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, right? Exhausted but still in pursuit. That's a worthy thing to have said about you. But to learn from Gideon here, to learn from Gideon, when you think that you have routed the enemy, don't stop, right? When you think that you have the victory won, don't stop. The fight is not over. The fight's not over until Jesus Christ comes back. (laughs) The fight isn't over. There remains a necessary and needful work to be done. There are 15,000 Midianites left. Right, 120,000 fell by the sword in the battle. 120,000 died. And <laughs> Gideon and his 300 hardly even had to lift their sword. Right? They crushed their pitchers. They blew their trumpets. And those men turned on each other with their own swords. And 120,000 men died in the field. But there are 15,000 Midianites left. And the Israelites are exhausted but still in pursuit. Those 15,000 men can easily regroup and come back, right? That's a pretty large number of men. They can easily go back, regroup, and then invade once again. The place swept and put in order. Those demons come back with seven of their buddies, (laughs) more wicked than themselves, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Don't stop. Keep fighting until every last Midianite is dead. And that that was the problem with Israel from the beginning, wasn't it? The Lord had put the nations, those wicked pagan nations in Canaan, under the ban. And when Joshua and the army, when the Israelites went in to take possession of their inheritance, they failed to completely drive out the Canaanites from the land. And those Canaanites became ensnares to them, right? They were ensnared by them. And you could say their their state was worse than it was at the beginning, This action is commendable of Gideon. He's exhausted but still in pursuit. Uh, Don't stop the battle until every last enemy is dead. However, despite what is commendable here of Gideon, we find again more contention in the heart of Israel. 
Gideon is pursuing Midian for the peace and well-being of his own countrymen. Gideon is doing this to see the people delivered from the hand of Midian. And he goes to his own countrymen then, the Israelites, these are Jews, Israelites, he goes to them for help. And he says to them, essentially, we're exhausted, we're hungry, give us bread so we can keep going. And he doesn't get the response to that that he would expect. Look at verse 5. So he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they're exhausted, and I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. And the leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? Now, <laughs> this is a cowardly, unbelieving, faithless response on the part of the Israelites who are living in Succoth. Certainly, they heard about the victory. 120,000 dead on the battlefield, and now Gideon in pursuit of the remaining 15,000 Midianites, and here the men of Succoth, cowardly, unbelieving, faithless, will not come to the aid of Gideon and his men. Gideon here is fighting for their benefit. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, sort of calls to mind or illuminates this particular evil. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? And uh, the answer to that rhetorical question is that it doesn't. <laughs> the love of God does not abide in him. Here we've got Gideon's own brothers, these Jewish, these Israelites, living in Succoth, living in Penuel, who fail to come to his aid. They see the remaining 15,000 Midianites in flight, they see Gideon with a mere 300 men. They are faithless. They are unbelieving, right? They see Gideon and his men exhausted. The answer to them appears clear. We're not giving any aid to you. So Gideon said to them, verse 7, For this cause, when, not if, right? that's faith on the part of Gideon, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, that's faith, right? Then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Here, Gideon's faith in the Lord and in the Lord's deliverance, is unwavering. He doesn't shake here. He doesn't tremble. It's when, not if. But there's definitely something disconcerting about Gideon's response to his countrymen, isn't it? You know, at first blush, someone may read past that and say, well, that sounds justified to me. But there's, when you stop to consider it, there's something disconcerting about it. He aims to give them a thrashing. He's going to come back and tear their flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. But listen, verse 8. Then he went up from there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. So he also spoke to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come back in peace, not if, but when, again, that's faith on the part of Gideon, when I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Now, the tower would have been a symbol of their strength. The tower would have been for their protection. That would have what uh, been part of their protective defenses of the city. They may have imagined themselves to be safe because of their tower when it should have been that they put their confidence and trust in the Lord. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Nevertheless, though, Gideon promises to tear it down. And again, something about this seems unsettling. What the men of Succoth, what the men of Penuel do, is reprehensible. It is cowardly and unbelieving. But Gideon here has to guard his own heart and not be tempted to sin. Delivering Israel, honoring the Lord, may have eventually or initially been Gideon's motivation for leading the Israelites into battle, those 300 men, and for pursuing the Midianites. But think with me, what might be his motivation for this action now against the men of Succoth and against the men of Penuel? It sounds like vengeance, doesn't it? Sounds more like vengeance. Gideon sounds like he thinks he deserves better. He's sounding entitled. The Lord isn't mentioned here. Gideon doesn't pray and inquire of the Lord what he should do. These are his brothers, his countrymen, even the Israelites went right when they, when they couldn't go into Edom. They trusted the Lord and they went around. What is going on here? It seems like Gideon is beginning to con be concerned about 
Maybe his own reputation, maybe his own feelings, his own hurt here. Let's think for a moment. Who is sovereign over all these things? Who's sovereign over these events? Sovereign even over the response of the men of Succoth and Penuel. Humility, humility on the part of Gideon would have paused and prayed, wouldn't it? Humility. Faith would have trusted the Lord to supply their need and direct their path. We're not going to get aid this way. The Lord will supply aid and provision another way. Would have trusted the Lord to provide another way. But Gideon doesn't do that, right? There's pride involved here. There seems to be personal hurt. And what starts as personal hurt leads to a personal vendetta. This is vengeance. Again, we see contention in the heart of Israel, but we also now begin to see compromise in the heart of Gideon. Well, what happens next in the narrative? How does this begin to play out? Look at verse 10. Now, Zeba and Zalmunna were at Karkor, their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in tents on the east of Nobah and Jogbaha, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. Just as the Lord had promised, right? Despite being overwhelmingly outnumbered, still Gideon shows great faith, great courage in the face of overwhelming numbers, right? They were overwhelmingly outnumbered. And now even great military prowess with a sneak attack on the army while they were resting, while the camp felt secure. And Gideon then takes captive the leaders Zeba and Zalmunna, wipes out the rest of the army. Incidentally, the name Zeba means sacrifice. <laughs> the name Zalmunna means shade or shelter refused. It would be, I'm sure, later or future Israelites who would have uh, uh, been struck or um, found interesting or delighted in those names given to those two wicked kings, sacrifice or shade or shelter refused. Orb and Zeb, those first ones taken by Ephraim, were commanders, but these were Melachim. They were kings. And in all this, the battle and the glory still belongs to the Lord. So in verse 13, then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle, from the ascent of Harris, and he caught a young man of the men of Succoth and interrogated him, and he wrote down for him the leaders of Succoth and its elders, 77 men. Then he came to the men of Succoth and said, here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city. If you can imagine this scene, right? He takes the elders of the city. He takes thorns of the wilderness and briars. And verse 16 says, He taught them. He taught the men of Succoth with thorns and briars. He shredded their flesh with thorns and briars in the wilderness. Verse 17, then he tore down the tower of Penuel, and not just tearing down the tower, which is what he said he would do, he also killed the men of the city, verse 17. Now, whatever you may think about how the Israelites or the Jews that dwelt in Succoth and Penuel may have deserved a thrashing for what they had done, Romans chapter 12, 19 warns us, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, this is very high-handed on the part of Gideon. You know, if, if the men of Succoth or the men of Penuel were Canaanite pagans under the ban, that would have been different, right? The Lord had commanded Joshua and the children of Israel to kill all of those who were under the ban. They were to not leave one alive. But these were not Canaanite pagans under the ban. These were brothers of Gideon, Israelites dwelling here in the nation, the men of Succoth and Penuel. And no longer can this be considered the righteous cause of God. We have to view this as a personal vendetta on the part of Gideon. In his rage, Gideon even goes beyond his threat at Penuel and kills the men of the city versus just tearing down their tower. Gideon here is acting like a tyrant, right? He's acting like a tyrant. Verse 18, he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? Obviously, they had 
crossed over one time before and had had a battle, killed men at Tabor. So they answered him, as you are, so were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, they were my brothers. This introduces something new to the narrative that we weren't aware of before. Gideon's brothers had been killed at Tabor by the armies of these two kings. He said in verse 19, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. And then he takes the Lord's name in vain, right, with, a, with an oath. As the Lord lives, if you would let them live, I would not kill you. Gideon's motivation now becomes more and more clear, doesn't it? Gideon's great, or given great grace, a tremendous victory by the Lord, Gideon then now forgets the Lord, no longer humbled, now filled with rage. He now turns to settle a personal grudge. He takes the Lord's name in vain as the Lord lives, and then he takes his vengeance. Verse 20, so he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise, kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. Jether, his son now, more resembles Gideon as he was before this account began, doesn't he? Jether sort of is a, now a sympathetic figure, the way that Gideon might have been in the beginning. And Gideon is well past being sympathetic at this point. Begin, Gideon has begun acting like a tyrant. Seems Gideon's memory is short. He's now intolerant of cowardice when he was once, once a coward. He's now intolerant of faithlessness. No fleece is offered here. His pride begins to swell. Gideon is offended. And now having his son Jether to do his dirty work for him, he's acting like a wicked, dynastic tyrant. And having his son do the work, the dirty work for him here is actually like a dynastic taunt, um, saying essentially that my son will rule in my stead when I'm gone and has Jether, asked Jether to stand up and kill uh, his captives in warfare. It backfires. The whole plan backfires with Jether's fear. It might have hurt Gideon's pride even more. Verse 21, so Zeba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. They taunt Gideon here. So Gideon arose, killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. It was a symbol of their kingly authority, a symbol of their rule. And here we have Gideon. From a humble, growing, maturing, God-given faith to a man of blood, to a man of vengeance, abusing, abusing the very strength and power that God had given him. He turns it now for his own personal use. He consumes it, you would say, on his own lusts. Now, Gideon's plummet from what was commendable character at one point, that plummet will continue as we'll see next week. It only gets worse from here. We see contention in the heart of Israel and we see growing compromise in the heart of Gideon. Reminds us of our lesson. Let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It may very well have been, if you think with me, it may very well have been that the Lord himself determined the incidents at Succoth and Penuel for the very purpose of cultivating a, continuance, a continuing reliance in Gideon upon the Lord, right? To humble Gideon, to provoke him to continue his dependence upon God. And he will often do that for our good, right? When Paul, Paul in 2 Corinthians, he was raised up, he was elevated, he was taken up, caught up into the third heaven. And lest he be caught up in his own pride, in his own exaltation, what did the Lord do? The Lord gave him a messenger of Satan, a thorn in his flesh, to buffet him. Why? To humble Paul, so that he might not, might, so that he might not be exalted in himself. It may very well have been that the Lord determined these incidents at Succoth and Penuel to humble Gideon to provoke him to continue relying on the Lord. And this is the way the Lord often handles us, doesn't he? We can come off just a, a great, tremendous victory, a tremendous blessing, and then we respond in self-confidence and pride and selfish ambition or selfish interests, and we forget 
where we were before the battle began. We forget how much we need the Lord. Paul was given an unspeakable blessing. He witnessed things he wasn't allowed to speak of. And the Lord followed that by allowing a thorn in his flesh, lest he be exalted above measure. And the Lord often does the same with us. Paul, like we are, we're to learn that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. We should rather than boast in our infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Success can be perilous. Uh, blessings if we don't guard our heart, if we don't look to the, not just to the gift, but to the gift giver, if we fail to look with gratitude and love and devotion to the gift giver, then blessings can be perilous. Blessings followed by ingratitude will breed rottenness in your bones. Gideon started out weak, and Gideon frankly needs to remember that he is weak even now. He needs to acknowledge that the Lord is the one who is strong. Faith is a day-by-day, sometimes hour-by-hour, even minute-by-minute determination. It's often a minute-by-minute decision. Faith is to cast off self-reliance and look to Christ who is our life. And we must remind ourselves of that always, every day, Hour by hour, even minute by minute. In chapter 7, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. The, current, the concern was that Israel would take pride in the victory, boast in themselves. When they didn't have the victory, when they were under the thumb of Midian, they were humble, weren't they? They were crying out to God for help. When they, when they did have it, they were prideful, contentious, unbelieving, faithless, boasting in themselves for what they had, even when they didn't actually participate in the battle. And it's often, it's a lesson that we must remember. Often it's only the mature in faith who can well handle prosperity. Uh, we need to be mature in our faith. Paul said that he learned how to be abased, and he learned how to abound, something we have to learn. Gideon here isn't handling prosperity well, and he becomes a prideful tyrant. So what's our lesson then? What would Peter say? Peter would say, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We all know, we've all heard the stories of seasoned saints that fall uh, any saint can stumble, right? Any of us can stumble. The Bible says that Gideon here fell into a snare. He fell into a snare. Whatever your snare, whatever besets you, whatever comes against you, you must fight. And you must fight in the power of God, in his strength, not in your own, in reliance upon him. And you have to remember your place. Remember how weak you are. Remember that initial humility with which uh, it caused you to cry out to God in dependence upon him for help and aid in your time of need. Remember that initial sense of deprivation, that sense of need. And don't be merely content with starting well. Be consumed with finishing well. It's he that endures to the end will be saved. He that endures to the end will be saved. And guard yourself against the snare. Take heed lest you fall. We must depend on the Lord, cry out to him, pray to him for help, always depending on him even when the battle seems to be won, even more so than this side of eternity. We always have a battle facing us, don't we? Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this time. Uh, thank you, Lord, for admonishing us from your word uh, with respect to this lesson. Help us learn here from the example of Gideon uh, not to rest in a prideful self-reliance, not to let our guard down when our enemy can easily regroup, remuster, come again against us. Help us, Lord, to continue the fight, to be watchful, to be sober, to be vigilant, knowing that our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, 
knowing, Lord, that we are easy prey when we don't depend on you in faith. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who in all ways was tempted as we are, and yet without sin. And help us to follow him, follow his example, follow his lead, follow him by faith, relying upon the power of the Spirit to strengthen us against our enemies. And Lord, we pray, please help us. uh, Help us, strengthen us, uh, keep us humble, keep us dependent. And we Lord, pray, Lord, that you would pour out your blessings upon us and hold us fast as we learn how to be abased and as we learn how to abound for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.